And when he was come near, Jesus, being Jesus, he, Jesus, beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hast known, if you've known, even thou, at least in this thy day, it was their day, the things which belong unto thy peace, that's a big word. We went over it in detail a few weeks ago. It was their day, and, and everything that has to do with that peace was theirs. But now they are hid. But now, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, and the enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and can pass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, that containment, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. He doesn't want you to have it tomorrow. And why is all this happening? Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Father, thank you for your word. Oh, you're awesome. I give you glory, honor, and praise, Lord Jesus. Thank you. You did not leave us and you did not forsake us. You gave us your word. You gave us your authority and your name. And you gave us the Holy Spirit to activate all of it. I thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your mighty holy name we pray. And everyone he said amen. amen amen look at your neighbor and say pastor going to do it yeah here we go here we go here we go here we go and our in our hub scripture the master tells us of those who missed the time of their visitation they missed the time they missed that word is kairos not chronos Chronos, chronometer, like your watch. But we're talking about kairos. That means a season. They missed their time. They missed their season, their fixed time. I put two definitions together on this one, really liked it. An opportunity available only within a specific predetermined period of time. An opportunity available only within a specific, predetermined period of time. Now, God did this a whole lot in the Old Testament. He said, you're going to do this on that day, and then you're going to do this on that day. And then this feast is going to happen here, and this feast is going to happen there. You ain't going to do it a week before. You ain't going to do it a week after. That's the opportune time. That's the kairos. In other words, the master tells of those who miss the time, who miss the kairos of their visitation, that season, that opportunity. Amen. We also expounded on and amplified many aspects within our hub scripture. I mean, it took weeks just to get through them verses. Amen. Thank, and thank you, Jesus, for that. Of, not being, of people not being sensitive to the time of visitation. But now let's look at a plethora of scriptures exemplifying those who were sensitive and perceived the time of their visitation. Put Mark 10, 46 through 50 on the screen. And they came to Jericho, they, Jesus and his posse. And as Jesus went out of Jericho with his disciples and a what? And a great number of people. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, and I thought it was interesting with that word just, to, just as, as my study. Sometimes you get clear cut. Uh, when you go back and research stuff, this is one of those that was interesting that's almost opposite. You have some places that say uh, the name Timaeus represents honorable. But then you have others that say it's a Hebrew derivative that means, um, um, oh, come on. That means defiled. So that's odd. I thought, well, maybe there's something in the name I can use. Well, I get so much difference of an opinion. I'm like, no, I can't use that one yet. I'm not settled on it. Amen. But I thought that was just an interesting nugget there. Uh, some people say the name Timaeus means uh, 
honorable, and then others say it's a actual taken from the Hebrew into Greek, and it means uh, defiled. So, but anyways, blind Bartimaeus, the son of, and that's what Bartimaeus means. That word bar means son of, son of Timaeus, the son of Timaeus sat by the highway side begging. This guy was in a bad place. So, you know, sometimes people get this idea that well. God only helps those who got it together. Really? What in the world scriptures have you been reading? I mean, that's the mindset of some people. I'm unworthy. I keep messing up. God ain't going to do nothing with me. That's just a lie for the devil is a liar. That's a lie from the pit of hell. And when he heard, that's being Bartimaeus, when he heard, how did his faith come by? When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to, to what? To think about it and ponder it? Hmm, let's see. What do you think would be the correct theological position on this? Now, I know some sets of the Pharisees are saying this, but now the Sadducees, now they're saying some of this. Some scribes and lawyers, they even have a different opinion of this guy. What would have happened if he sit around and tried to intellectually reason <laughs> and try to sort through in his head things about Jesus? Once again, he would have missed his time of visitation. But what did he do? He began to what? Cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him and the church that he should just hold his praise down. All the deacons gave him the left foot of fellowship right out of the building when they started raising their hands and crying and saying, Thank you, Jesus. Sally Sue looked over at you from the other aisle and said, Girl, it don't take all that. Many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal. Hallelujah. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Yes, yes. And Jesus stood still. Jesus stood still. Oh, there's sometimes places in Scripture that just make me want to shout. This is one of them. Woo! Hallelujah! Jesus stood still for a blind man begging on the side of the road. Just like when you're reading the book of Acts and, and Stephen was getting ready to be stoned, anybody knows that anybody in authority, when you sit down on his throat, that's the position of authority. You're sitting. You have everybody else to do the work. Why? Because that's the nature of authority. You, you, have, the, uh, you have authority to tell people to do different things. And it said that when Jesus went through his went through, he was seated at the right hand of the Father. But yet when we look in the book of Acts, who, my Lord, and the first martyr, Scripture says that he looked up in the heaven and he saw Jesus standing. You got Jesus off his throne. Amen. He stood still, and Jesus commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. The only problem is, is that, well, I'm going to get ahead of myself. Let me hold off on that. I'm going to hit that in a minute. Verse 50, and he casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. There was never a recording of Jesus passing this way again. This was a time of visitation. See, that's what I'm, once again, sometimes it's like, why is pastor so dogmatic? Why sometimes is he actually, he seems to be, insensitive to feelings and he's just so bottom lined and does he not have compassion and sympathy and empathy and mercy and it's like yes 
That's why sometimes I'm so hard. Because I know that he ain't going to go through Jericho again. So if you're in Jericho, somebody needs to rattle your cage because this is the time of your visitation. And somebody needs to say it long and strong. You don't need a patty cake around. Because this is going to affect your life. Your, it, not just your religious tradition or how you do Sundays. This can affect your life. So yeah, I, 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 I get a little bit on a soapbox about it from time to time because we care. The opportunity of a lifetime is in the lifetime of the opportunity. I know that firsthand. I made a mistake about five years ago that I wish I would have done different. Because when my pastor went out to the West Coast, we went to a 212 out there, and that was the time that when we went, we got revelation about what we're supposed to do in the next part of our life with Pastor Kimberly. She was in a crossroads, so to speak. Which way do I go? Well, how, you know, what way do our, would we turn? Well, Lord said, go to 12. So we did in faith. And you know what? He didn't disappoint. We found out. But there was another opportunity. And for those that think, well, you know, you're talking about something of man and not of God, that doesn't interest me, then you just really don't understand the anointing and how, and how God can use different people for different things. But what he did is that he had, he had another event out there that we could, I could have swung it. I could have went by myself. I could have swung it. It would have been tight because, you know, to fly out there to California and eat and the food and rent a car and all that stuff is, is not cheap. We could have done it. It would have brought things way low, but I could have done it. And I was sitting back and I was like, you know, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to this time. I missed a moment. Why? It's because he had his pastor there, Bishop T.D. Jakes. And there was a point in time in the service where Bishop says, Pastor, he looked at Pastor and says, Pastor, he says, I want all of your people under you. I want them up here on stage. I want to lay hands on them too. I missed an opportunity because I was looking at my bank account. I missed the day of that visitation. That matters to me. Y'all might not get it or think anything of it, but knowing the impartation of things, that, that really mattered. Wish I was there. Pastor Rob was there. Hallelujah. Amen. He got in on that. The day of your visitation, the opportunity of a lifetime was in the lifetime of an opportunity. If you refuse to be sensitive, you'll not perceive the Lord coming your way. Oh, how I wished I would have been more sensitive to the things of God instead of just to everyday life at that particular time. Because just like Jesus never went through Jericho, I don't know if Bishop will ever do that with pastors, Pastor Ron's, uh, the people in the fellowship. I don't know. Maybe it would happen someday. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe it will happen. I don't know. But I do know I missed that opportunity. You'll spend the rest. Listen, if, you, if you're not sensitive, you'll not perceive the Lord coming your way. And you'll spend the rest of your life, Bartimaeus, sitting by the highway and begging and pleading about something that was yours for the taking. All because you missed the time of your visitation. How sad to be sitting around and then having somebody else coming and begging with you and be like, man, I wish you'd have been here last week that Jesus guy came through. Oh, I was here. Well, you were. Well, why didn't you go out to meet him or do something? Uh, I don't know, you know. It took too much energy and time. and I'd have had to have lowered my pride and get out of my comfort zone. Listen, the Lord doesn't want you in a comfort zone. If you're, listen, if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. 
Since when, when you read through any of the scriptures, did the Lord want to set somebody up so cushy and cozy and just keep them in a comfort zone? <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't find it in my Bible. It's always go ye. And once you go here, then I want you to go there. And it's all, always something different. My Lord, Paul was out of his comfort zone all the time. Peter, uh, all the time. Look back at the prophets. Every time they would always, the Lord would have them somewhere that would definitely get them out of their comfort zone. And so he would have had to have done that. How sad if he'd have been like, man, I w you should have. Because my, my brother, he, he'd been lame since birth. He's walking now. Uh, he hooked up with that guy down in Capernaum, and I'm telling you what, Uncle Freddie can see now. Yeah, he was down in Judea, and uh, Uncle Freddie, you know, went to one of his evangelistical outreaches. <laughs> he can see. How sad. Missing that time of visitation. Because your lack of insight will prevent your foresight. I am preaching better than you're listening. Your lack of insight will prevent your foresight. Chew on it. You will be doomed to live in a perpetual state of today. Crippled and dependent on others. But if you are sensitive to your time of visitation, you can cast away your garment and arise. Yes. Yes. Let me teach you here a little bit. And you'll get a lot more out of this. This will make you look at this scripture different. Beggars were given cloaks they were given cloaks you couldn't just go out and just decide you're going to make one and wear one it was like they didn't give out certificates uh, or license to be able to beg per se like we do now a little card or maybe you could bring an app up here on your phone that says yeah you went through the proper procedures you're good so what they did is they would give you permission if you if you qualified and they gave you permission to beg it would be in, you knew that in the form of they would give you a cloak beggars were given cloaks which gave them permission to beg and they listen here's why they did that lazy people were taking up this vocation and posing on the truly needy Now, this was a big deal in Jerusalem. Why? Because Jerusalem was a breeding ground for beggars. They were coming from the north, east, south, and the west to Jerusalem. Why? Because many of the people that lived in Jerusalem, all these religious folk, they wanted their generosity and piety to be seen. Jesus, Jesus talked about it quite often. They just want to be seen of men. So these people got together and said, man, I ain't go down there and just sit around. These people, you know, all these priests and Pharisees and scribes and lawyers and all these uppity, uppity, uppities. Man, all you got, I'm telling you, I've seen it. All you got to do is sit down and beg and they be throwing money at you. And it worked. And so much so that now all of a sudden they said, no, we got to have some kind of protocol in place. Not just anybody can come and beg. You have to go through the process to officially be able to beg so it doesn't take away from the true needy. Amen? These cloaks were very identifiable and distinctive, being of a certain style and color, which distinguished them from other professions. You can, you can tell a difference between... Uh, if, a, if, 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 you land, if, you, if I had up here on the stage and I had a doctor in his uniform, a fireman in his uniform, a police officer in his uniform a judge in their uniform, you could be able to distinguish the office by the garments that they wore. Yeah. It's no different than today. Yeah. And in the culture of the time, when a beggar cast aside his cloak, he cast aside his profession, 
his only possession is all he had. His sole source of income. His shade from the heat. His warmth from the cold. It was his way of collecting and containing money. He'd spread that garment out for people to toss it in. And it was his way of collecting and containing money. Listen, when he cast aside his garment, he cast aside his life. See, it wasn't just like a shirt or a sweater, you know. Well, this is a sweater that I got for Christmas three years ago that they knitted for me. It looks as bad today as it did back then. I'll be glad to take this off and toss it to the side. It wasn't like it's just, just an article of clothing. A beggar's cloak was his life support system. Because his cloak and his profession were one and the same. So Bartimaeus cast off his known life for another. I mean, it's just as I mean, this is just as much as you uh, uh, going ahead and just going in and quitting your job, telling the people to place that you rent your landlord uh, when a lease is uh, up due. I'm not. I'm not going to be around anymore. That's the equivalent of it. That's the only way he could survive is that cloak. It gave him permission to beg for others. That's the only way he got sustenance in life. It's the only thing to keep him dry and to keep him warm, to keep the heat off. I mean, this was his life. And Bartimaeus cast off his known life for another and he never looked back. Well, why doesn't the blind, how can we don't see, uh, the, see the blind see as much in the church anymore, Pastor? Because nobody wants to really cast off their garment anymore. I don't want to cast off my whole life and everything for the master. I just want to do what I want to do. And you know what, Jesus, you just, you know, come and, and you know, serve me. Do for me if you're a miracle worker, heal, healer. Do what you do. You ain't going to touch my coat, though. Leave it alone. Leave my life alone. Leave my sustenance alone. Leave my source of taking care of myself alone. I'm not giving it to you. I'm going to hold on to it. You don't realize, Jesus, if I give this up, I I give everything up. And if you don't come through, and I I don't know, are you going to come through if you don't come through? Because if you don't come through, I'm ruined in life. When we can finally cast our garments aside, we will finally see the blind seeing again. Elisha is another example of knowing the time of his visitation. When Elijah came to him, for those taking notes, not on the screen, but for those taking notes, that's in 1 Kings 19. You'll find it 19 through 21. It's another example. Because Elisha, just like Bartimaeus, took all that he had and cast it away. Not giving himself the opportunity to turn back. He took all of his oxen, all the equipment for the oxen. What does that mean? His way of life. Basically, if he was a farmer, he just just gave all his tractors away. If you're a carpenter, you, you, you just gave all your tools away. If you're a mechanic, that big toolbox you got, you just gave it away. No chance of coming back. It's what blind Bartimaeus did. I'm not looking back. This is it. If Jesus doesn't come through, it's over for me. But a lot of times we want to keep a little something something. We don't, we don't really want to sell out. We really don't want to throw our garment away. We really don't want to slaughter our oxen and, and burn all the yokes. 
which represent there's no going back. We want that little bit of security, don't we? That us security. That self-preservation -preser security. Me coming to my own rescue. You know, I mean, because, you no, know, if it don't work out with Jesus, and, you know, I'm not totally doomed. It won't be great, but I ain't going to start from nothing. I got a little something over here. God, just be blunt with you. You know I'm going to be. Do you want a miracle or not? Yes, sir. Well, it will cost you something. Faith will cost you something. Now, you gain a whole lot more. It's the best investment you could. It yields a better return than anything. But you will have to give something up. You can't have the blind, you can't have the cloak on and see at the same time. Elisha, you can't follow Elijah around and, and be able to do double the stuff one day and be able to hold on to all your oxen and stuff at home just in case things get a little rocky, you have a place to come back to. Jesus. They're going to hang you upside down, Peter. I'm telling you ahead of time. And you're not going fishing anymore. I want you to feed my sheep. This little episode, you out there in the boat with the others because you're an influence and they were following you, that ain't going to happen no more. You're going to have to give up everything. Can I, can I go ahead and go a little bit deeper with you in some revelation? When you read that part where the master said, cast your nets on the other side, let me go ahead and just back up a little bit. I'll give you with the, I'll, I'll, I'm coming with a double combination here this morning. I'm going to knock you out this morning. We don't realize how much Jesus, how the master cares about us individually. A lot of times we think, well, his will, his kingdom, he's doing his thing, but me, he don't care about me. That is a bunch of hogwash. The first time that he met them and, he, and they toiled all night, he said, cast your nets on the other side. And it was so full of fish that it took a partnership. I ain't got time to preach on that. You need partnership because you can't haul it in yourself. You're going to have to have somebody to help you. You can't be a lone ranger. Every joint supplies you. Set it up that way. And so, casting that on the other side, and Jesus, and then Peter was like, you, yeah, I'm going to follow you. You're the real deal. And we, and we leave the story, and then we think about Peter following Jesus around everywhere. But, around everywhere. but let's back up a minute. There was a whole net full of fish there. What does fish mean to a fisherman? Money, 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 money. That was the livelihood. Yeah. You know what Jesus is saying here? He's saying, you go ahead and come follow me. This is such a mother load. This is going to keep you and your wife. You're gonna take, I'm going to take care of you for years off of this mother load. Yeah. Oh, what do you think they did? Just drew the net in and looked at the fish and said, that's nice, and then just let them all go? <laughs> These are fishermen. They took it to the marketplace and they were smiling on their payday. Ooh. I guarantee you, people are like, where in the world did you get all these fish from? Because remember, there were six. Oh, the Holy Ghost is helping me this morning. They were not, were they not experienced fishermen? Did they not fish all night long and catch nothing? Would you think that they were any worse than any other fishermen? I guarantee you when they got there, people were just flabbergasted. Man, ain't nobody been bringing in nothing here lately. Where in the world did all this come from? Oh, you want me to break it down? Okay. Everybody getting laid off. How come you still made rent? COVID coming. People getting laid off. How come you, how come you okay? How come your car ain't repoed? Because he took care of them. That's exactly what all that meant. So let's fast forward. 
Jesus said, follow me, and he made sure that he had an income for his family. Now as we go at the end, when he went back fishing again, his old life, trying to sustain himself, it didn't work out with Jesus, but I'm, I know how to do this, so I'm going to just take care of myself. And it made specific, I mean, even the amount. The 150 some fishes? Let's go to John. I feel this this morning. I feel the Holy Ghost in here this morning. John 21. I'm getting so excited, I'm about to wrinkle my Bible. You want to see what, how God cares about people? And about what the Spirit of God can do to somebody? We'll start from verse 6, John 21, 6. I threw them on the spot back there, so if there's delay, it's my fault. They're always on it when I give them the scriptures. John 21, 6. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. If you're a retail store, that, that means that we have so many people come in today, we literally do not have a thing. We need to call our supplier immediately. We can't even open tomorrow because we have nothing to sell. That's exactly what's going on here. The mother load came in. Or it's like somebody, that, you know, you, I guess you've seen these I've not, I, have I? I can't remember. If, I think maybe I've watched half an episode, something about gold rush or people try to get gold or something. It's like somebody, you know, finding that 10-pound gold nugget. We ain't talking about little ounces and flakes that they can finally, you know, melt down and get something. We're talking about getting a rock, a 10-pound rock of gold. You know what they're going to be doing? All right, pack it up, guys. <laughs> our... our our season's over for right now. We'll come back next year. Maybe. Maybe. That's what happened here. A multitude of fishes. They were not, listen, they. Notice that because I'm coming to that. They. They is plural. Because if you'll read up above that, Peter had some people with him. They. They were not able to draw it in for the multitude. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We might not have a bells and whistles in here, but you'll never come out here and not be able to have something pulled out of the Word. Because anybody can get into the Word, but an anointed speaker will be able to pull something out of it. We got that, praise God. Not able to draw it for the multitude. They, they, they were not able to. Verse 7, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter is the Lord. Now Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, and he girded his fisher's coat onto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land. Some people, as it was 200 cubits, some people think that's 100 yards. That's about right. Listen, they were what? Dragging the net with fishes. A great multitude. They were, where do you, what do you think once again they were going to do with these fishes? <clears throat> Try to feed 5,000 people again and have a big fish fry? <laughs> once again, Jesus is getting ready to, to make a demand on Peter and say, I need you to never go back to this life again. But what I am going to do from this life, I'm going to provide a way that you can sustain you and your family for a long time. God will never have to make, will never have you to make a sacrifice and never have something that will cost you that you will not receive a hundredfold, 30, 60, and a hundredfold in this lifetime. He said it. That's not good Pentecostal hype up and want to make you clap preaching. That's scripture right there. I got you, Peter. I got you. You took care of. Don't worry about your wife. It took care of. I'll feed you while you're along with me. You're with the, the you'll be part of the Jesus Christ Evangelistic Association, and I'm making you an ambassador. Everywhere you go, they'll know and they'll go ahead and take care of you. But for your wife at home, go ahead. Your rent is paid in full. Amen. 
And verse 8, and the other disciples came in a little ship. Oh, I said that. Okay, dragging the net with them. Verse 9. Now, remember that they were dragging, right? That's so many fish. I mean, it tells you it was a multitude. It gives, it's going to give us a count here in a second, too. And I did a research on this. This is relevant. I did research on the type of fish that were in the Sea of Galilee, and they were anywhere from average fish that, that they would catch anywhere from like 5 to like 15 pounds. So I was conservative, and I just went on like the 5-pound margin here. Five pounds. We're talking about catchable fish. We're not talking about little bitty croakers. We're not talking about a mini mullet. We're talking about fish that you're going to take to market to sell. You think Jesus is going to give them mini mullets? A load of croakers in the net? For all those watching online that are not a part of the Gulf Coast, it's a part of all culture. You can research and see if those fish are common in our area. No, Jesus is going to give them something they can take to market and sell. And it's from 5 to 15 pounds, a lot of these fish, depending on the maturity of the fish. Keep that in mind because remember, they were dragging. They were dragging. They were dragging. Verse 9, And as soon as they were come to land, they saw the fire of coals there and fish, there, fish lay there on and, and bread. And Jesus saying to them, Bring... Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Okay? They drug it to shore. And, and it was a big multitude for them to drag it. Have you got that so far? I've said it like three or four times. Have you got that? Verse 11. Here's what the anointing of God can do to you. Because Peter already knows. You know what? I've seen this before. He did this before and took care of my family. He's going to be doing it again. I know that's what he's doing. I know he's going to, take, he's going to require something of me, but he's, going, but he's took care of me. And he's took care of my own. And I, I guarantee you, faith rose up in Peter like you would not believe. And in verse 11, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land. It said they were dragging. Now all of a sudden it just says who? One man. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land. Listen, full of great fishes. Not minnows. These big fishes. 153. Somebody get your calculator out. What's five pounds? We'll go on the minimal. Five pounds times 153. 765 pounds a man's dragon. Wow. We'll talk about Samson type of strength here. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's why you come out here. Yeah. We need to hear from you, Lord. Bye. Shut up. The power of God came upon him in a mighty way. And he was able to drag over 700 pounds. What if we wasn't? Because what if they were 10 pound or 15 pound fish? Let's see anybody here just drag 300 pounds of fish. 700, over 700 pounds conservative, conservatively, just like 5,000 men not counting the women and children. You can only estimate on that. You don't know. I'm kind of getting conservative on, on this. But over 700 pounds. Yes. And for all there was so many, yet was not the net broken. I'm speaking prophetically in the house for the business owners. You need to pick your ears up. You think that you can't handle what God's getting ready to do, but your net won't break. I need this. I need that. I got to have this. I got to have that. Why is this coming now? Your net is not going to break. And you're going to be able by yourself pull that heavy load in this time and season. Amen. Lord, I thank you. Amen. 
And so Peter followed the Lord. He knew the time of his visitation. Elisha followed the Lord, knowing the time of his visitation. And Bar- blind Bartimaeus followed the Lord, casting off everything, knowing this is the day of his visitation. Because if you're not sensitive, you'll miss the Lord coming your way. But if you're sensitive and you know the time of your visitation, there's things that others got blindsided with. It won't be for you. It won't be hid from your eyes. I know of a minister that his personal funds he had in the stock market. And 2008 come up. And the Lord dealt with him. I want you to take all your stuff from this, 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 and I want you to put it there, 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 there. And 2008 hit, and the stock market went. (laughs) People still trying to recover from that today. Doing good on drawing for the interest on their nest egg. Well, there's, there's hardly a nest egg now, and there's really even no interest. And then the people that were handling his money that he told them to do this thought he was as crazy and loony as could be. They were not believers. But they made sure that they come and, and visited him. When, when this was said and done, they said, you know, I don't know about this Jesus and your God kind of stuff like that, but if you ever get any kind of impression again about where to put your money real quick, <laughs> I want you to let us in on it. Because when everybody else lost, listen, he gained. He gained. Because he knew the time of his visitation. Why would have happened, Isaac, if you didn't listen to the Lord? And the whole world said, this is crazy. There's a famine in the land. You need to get yourself down to Egypt. Ain't no use doing farming up here. It ain't going to do no good. But the Lord said that he had him to sow in the same land in the time of famine. He wouldn't have had the bumper crop. Bible said he cashed in big time. Tell me that God don't care about his children's welfare. Yeah. What if he'd have missed the day of his visitation? He had just went down to Egypt. He'd been groveling and grubbing with all of them, just trying to get a little something, something. And he would have missed the mother load. Why? Because he missed the day of his visitation. Because to the natural man, when uh, it ain't raining and it hadn't been raining, is not the time to take your seed and put it in the ground. But that's in the natural. But what if you hear something? Let me say it this way. But what if you hear someone? See, once again, that seed, back in that day, that seed that Isaac had, I mean, that's how he's going to eat tomorrow. In our modern day times, it's like your savings account. You can live week to week and buy your groceries and stuff, but in case the car breaks down, the fridge breaks down, da 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 you have something in savings to be able to be able to handle that. Sowing them seeds means I'm putting my whole tomorrow in the hands of the master today. I'm taking my whole savings account. I'm emptying it out because he told me to. Stand to your feet as the music plays. My Lord, I got one, two, three, four more scriptures that we are not going to get to today. But we're going to see that we're going to hear the same thing over these next few weeks of those that were sensitive to the Spirit of God. 
and that those that knew that it was the day of their visitation, that their bishop had come, and their bishop wants to give them new realms and take them into new levels to have them to have increase and upgrades. But if you don't know the time of your visitation, you can still stay by the, the roadside begging. Now, if you, if you miss your visitation, listen, the Lord is good and gracious. He'll send somebody around to flick some change into your cloak so you'll survive. You'll be took care of. But you're not going to have your sight and be able to follow Jesus like he wants you to. You cannot be sensitive to the Lord. And when Elisha and when Elijah comes around and says, drop everything and come follow me, you could say, well, can I do it part-time? Can I, can, can, I, can, can I walk with you on Monday through Thursday, but let me, let, let me come here and work my land? You know, I think I can work that out. I can still afford some of my servants. So I can, I, can, can I work my land for a few days a week? He could have worked his land, and you know what? The Lord would have made sure he had a bopper crumper. But you know what? He would not be written in this book and be able to do twice the miracles that Elijah did. Yeah. And if Peter would have looked at Jesus and said, you know what? I've been through this before. It didn't turn out good. I'm sorry. You're not going to get a second, a second chance for a first impression, Lord. I'm going to hang out with my boys in the boat. You do your thing, I'm going to do mine. If that would have been the case, listen. It says that even in heaven, the new Jerusalem, it's going to have not only the 12 tribes of Israel's name in the city, but the 12 apostles' names too. For eternity, we're going to, we're going to be cruising by that place and we're going to be able to say that, see the name Peter. Can I, I know you're standing, can I just go a little bit deeper? Just, just, can, can I, just for a second? I want you to notice how Jesus addresses him, and I'm, and I'm closing. It would be my third closing, but it would be my final closing. And verse 15, it said, So when they had dined, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, listen, he said, Simon, he said, Simon, son of Jonah. He didn't call him by the name that he called him by. He called him by the name he used to be called. Do you still want your old name and your old life? Or do you want to follow me and pick up the mantle and have the new life and new identity that I gave you? And you can if you're sensitive and you don't miss the day of your visitation. Are you sensitive?